Welcome to the Evergrid 2.0 Massive Open Online Course, module number two called Multi-Energy Networks. This module consists of three parts and they will walk you through uh, multi-energy networks and how to model and simulate them. My name is Peter Palensky. I'm a professor at the Technical University Delft in the Netherlands and I work on intelligent electrical power grids. So we work on the power systems of the future that are supposed to be green, resilient and efficient. This is part number one of our multi-energy networks module. Let's start with the motivation. Decarbonizing our society with renewables means that we have a generation source that is clean, that is good, no emissions, it's very cheap. Um, marginal costs of wind and solar are basically zero. You don't have to dig for oil and then purchase it. But there are also downsides. First, these sources don't do what we want. So we cannot turn on and off the wind and the sun as we like. With fossil generation, that is possible. Stability is another issue. These sources are typically connected with power electronic converters, so we don't have the rotating inertia of the synchronous generators anymore. And the stakeholder and players situations is much more complicated because we have distributed generation with millions of solar panels instead of just three um, big power plants. So to overcome these challenges, we typically have a mix of some digital technology, some integration of sectors and some distributed systems. So these are three um, ingredients on how to make this decarbonization possible. If you look at the power system as it is, it's already complicated, um, but adding this integration, digital transformation and distributed features to it will make it even more complicated and even complex. There are difficult decisions to be done. Um, you will have to work with a multidisciplinary problem. There's lots of uncertainty in the generation side with wind and solar, but also on the load side with smart uh, loads. And there's lots of uh, time constraints, complexity that you have to uh, get fixed. And as I said, this multi-stakeholder situation doesn't make uh, the situation easier. So designing, planning and operating such a system is not easy anymore. You cannot do a swing equation at the back of an envelope as we had it in the past. So you need uh, massive uh, numerical support to uh, get uh, these systems uh, planned and operated. This numerical support is typically done with numerical models. Yeah. If they are embedded in a, in a larger workflow, such as here, you also call them sometimes digital twins. But the core is a system description yeah, uh, that tries to cover all the phenomena, static phenomena and dynamic phenomena of the system that you would like to understand. Um, during the design phase, and the planning phase, you can use such a model for dimensioning uh, the assets, for stability analysis. You can go through certain scenarios. You can check for interoperability, especially when it comes to controls. How do different controllers like each other? This is something you almost cannot calculate anymore nowadays, and you need numerical methods for this. During operation, this model can also be useful. Um, you can check it for uh, plausibility. So you, if you have a, a model following reality in real time, then you can check for deviations and these deviations might be a pointer to some problem. Um, you can also maybe fast forward into the future if you have a fast uh, twin and you can go through scenarios, check for robust operational decisions and you can also use them for post-mortem an an analysis. If something uh, broke, you can uh, use such a numerical model to find out what happened and why did it happen. Um, 
These models are, in the case of the operations, quite uh, integrated in workflows. You have to maybe update parameters on the fly. You have to identify topologies. Uh, so there's lots of data handling and management um, operations. And there's also people in the loop. Uh, so this application here on this picture could be the control room where people sit and they want um, informed uh, uh, decisions based on these numerical models. If you want to describe such a power system of the future, um, you will very likely be confronted with a number of different uh, uh, mathematical foundations, uh, models of computation. In the left upper corner, you have the physics, all the transformers, cables, or pipes in the case of a, of a heat, heat uh, system, um, generators. So this is all done with uh, continuous models based on differential equations. This is the good old world of electrical engineering. Lower left corner is the IT, everything that is digital. Um, if you describe that, you ideally do it with discrete models, um, um, state machines, queuing theory, these kinds of things. Yeah? And you can already see that these upper differential equations and the state machines don't fit together. Yeah? They are completely incompatible in terms of methods, languages and tools. But that's not the end. The right side also has uh, uh, new uh, mechanisms that are part of this uh, future power system. The upper right corner is everything that has a, a behavior, roles, that's people, but also software agents um, um, that act on, on somebody's behalf. Um, uh, what you can do is uh, game theory, if there are only a few players or, or multi-agent systems, if you have many of them. But again, this doesn't fit to the other two worlds. And the lower right corner is uh, stochastic statistical processes that might be somehow in the loop in your system or that at least deserve description, such as the weather or other phenomena that you're not able to model in a first principle way. So with these four um, sub-problems that you typically stumble over when you uh, try to describe an energy system of the future, you already have four different worlds that you have to uh, combine somehow. And this is not easy. So the future energy system that you're trying to uh, design or optimize or operate is cyber-physical, so you have discrete and continuous elements, it's multi-physical, maybe you have different energy carriers involved at multi-time scale, so there are very fast um, phenomena that you would like to cover, but at the same time, and that's the catch, <laughs> at the same time you have maybe very slow phenomena uh, in, the, in the loop that also needs uh, uh, solving, or maybe you would like to look into the uh, yearly developments of, of that uh, system. So uh, different time scales have to be combined in ideally one model. They are very complex, so every time you have um, memory, which is often the case with, with discrete models, uh, that there are states memorized, sometimes there's software involved that learns, yeah? you have hidden states, they are not uh, visible a priori. Sometimes the, the uh, behavior is, a, is, is the result of an emergent behavior, of, of swarm behavior of many, many players. And then you uh, only see the, the, the behavior when, when you finally execute the model, not by just looking at it. And there is also probabilistic elements in it. Yeah? Sometimes there are uh, um, very rare but high impact events, uh, very difficult to describe. So <laughs> you need a modeling methodology or a modeling tool that can deal with all these things somehow. The question is how to do that. Um, one way could be you pick your favorite language, your favorite method, your favorite tool and squeeze everything into that methodology. So maybe you are a grid person, then you have maybe a grid simulator. Yeah? Um, but if you want to model all the other phenomena, communication technology, energy markets, people behavior, 
in the language of that grid simulator, you will uh, very soon find out this, this is not doable. Yeah? You would need to simplify too much and make too many mistakes. Second option is uh, taking a universal language um, that uh, can describe basically everything. Um, there are such languages out there. Modelica is one of them. They are very promising, but they often have uh, performance problems, especially when you simulate large systems, large systems of many players that interact. They are typically not uh, uh, performing well in such uh, monolithic uh, universal uh, solvers. And the third option would be is to simulate these sub problems in their own dedicated uh, world, in their own dedicated tool and solver and language and data set, and then combine these sub solutions somehow. Yeah. And this is exactly what we are doing very often, because it's the most uh, pragmatic and productive uh, method that we have at our disposal. And uh, we call this co-simulation. So the co can mean we combine several models and solvers and the solvers run concurrently or they solve it collaboratively and they are connected. So all these co's end up in the word co-simulation in the end. Here is an example of uh, vehicle charging. Um, you have an electric vehicle with a battery, lots of power electronics involved, charging station and the grid and maybe a market. Um, that gives you energy prices. And if, if your assignment is to optimize something, maybe the market rules should be fair or uh, robust or fast, or the, the, the grid controls should be um, resilient and self-healing. So whatever you're optimizing here, um, you could put all these elements into dedicated specialized simulators, maybe even with models created by separate experts. So you you summit a group of experts, uh, all specialized on a sub-problem, let them choose their tool that they like, and in the end, if they are ready and if the, the sub-modules run and work, you connect them. This is the moment when co-simulation becomes a bit uh, tricky, and uh, there is a, a couple of uh, uh, messages and uh, recommendations that I will have to you regarding this. Let's look at an easy case, real-time co-simulation. Um, sounds complicated, but it's, it's, the, it's the easier case. Uh, it means that uh, the sub-modules run in real time. So if you simulate a phenomenon that takes three seconds, model time it will also take three seconds when you execute the model. So it really follows the clock on your wall in the model as well. Um, so if you have two of these models, they run at the same speed, so you can easily connect them. So if they um, share certain signals and variables, uh, you can exchange them on the fly without thinking much, as long as this uh, exchange happens uh, instantaneously. So there is no need for synchronization. They are implicitly synchronized because they all run at the same speed in real time. Um, we have such real-time simulators in, in, in operation quite often because we can connect real hardware to it in the loop. Yeah? Because the real hardware, which is a machine or a person uh, or a controller or a protection relay, as you see it here, um, also runs in real time because it's a real object in the real world. And uh, this is why the simulator that uh, simulates the grid, for instance, um, needs to run in real time as well. And the, the communication and the signals and the variables that these two instances share, the simulated grid and the real box that you're connecting to it, um, they, uh, yeah, they share uh, variables and exchange them in real time. So this is an easy case. Um, we use it for a number of um, uh, analysis. Here are a few examples. Uh, we analyzed hydrolyzers. They can produce uh, hydrogen with uh, uh, hopefully renewable electricity. And we tested uh, them because people are afraid that they 
could be troublemakers. Yeah? They are connected with inverters, they have strange dynamics, and if you have really huge hydrolyzers in the tens and hundreds of megawatts, uh, and many of them, uh, it might impact grid stability. So we made a study, and in the end it turned out um, that if you imply proper controls, they are not the troublemaker, they are the troubleshooter. Yeah? They can uh, offer stability services, so frequency stability, voltage stability, Everything you dream of, these hydrolyzers are very robust, <laughs> easygoing devices, and the converters are very fast. And if you imply the proper controls, you can do very good things for the grid. And this was done with the real-time simulator. We simulated a real network, uh, very accurately modeled the north of the Netherlands. And we uh, connected uh, the inverters for the hydrolyzers to it, and we were going through all kinds of nasty situations, faults and uh, disasters uh, where the hydrolyzer had to um, support the grid and we, we saw that this is uh, perfectly possible. Another example is with protection relays. Uh, in a large European project we tested uh, existing protection relays from several manufacturers called ABCD here and we exposed them to the power system of the future with lots of renewables, lots of electric vehicles and, 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 and low inertia and uh, other uneasy things. And uh, we checked how far existing relays can deal with these future situations. And it turned out many of them are not uh, properly prepared and we have to catch up and make relays much smarter that they can understand what to do in such a complex situation. Again, this is real-time co-simulation. We have real devices, we have simulated parts, and they are just implicitly synchronized. You could just connect them, run them, and make an experiment. Last example, again with real devices. In this case, it was PMUs, phaser measurement units, was backup protection or backup WAMPAC, wide area measurement protection and control. So if the local relays um, don't do the right thing in the right time, which can happen because the situations are getting more and more complex so that the local information that these relays have is not sufficient anymore to, to make the right decision, then we can do a wide area protection. It's of course much slower <laughs> than the local one, but it's better than nothing. And we can use the global picture. So we, uh, we have PMUs, we have detailed insight into the situation of the grid. So we have a database, we can use machine learning and um, make a much more informed decision a bit later of course but uh, it can catch those cases uh, that are not uh, covered by the traditional relays anymore and again this was a real-time simulation real-time co-simulation setup so now comes the less um, easy case the non-real-time part so if you have sub-modules or simulators that run with different with a different notion of time, then you have to synchronize them somehow. But let's have a look how the software architecture looks like. So we have here four simulators, all of them have a solver and a model on board, and uh, they are part of one bigger, one in the real world unified system. So they share physical states, they share variables, and uh, these variables have to be the same in both or in three simulators depending on where they appear. This is the job of the simulation master. So the simulation master gets these shared variables and exchanges them uh, with the um, respective simulators that need these variables. And it also proceeds the simulators in time. So it tells the simulators please proceed in time, slow down, <laughs> or other commands that it has at its disposal. Um, inside the simulators you have a solver and a model, yeah, the sub-model and um, the interface to, to the master is typically time-stepping and variable synchronization, initialization as well. In the beginning all the simulators of course have to start from a known state. Um, what you just, just, just have seen is the, is the lower part here, the co-simulation uh, where the, the variables are exchanged and uh, the, the solvers step uh, through time, but it's embedded in a bigger workflow, uh, in a bigger 
um, scripting engine as it's, as it's shown here, because in the end, uh, what you do uh, with, the, with the simulation is an experiment. Yeah? You cannot ask, where is my optimum or where is my preferred state? You have to search for it. You have to make hundreds and maybe thousands of experiments and slowly learn how all the parameters and, and degrees of freedom that you might have have an impact on your, on your optimization function. So what you do is you create scenarios. It's a left upper corner. Initialize uh, the simulation and start it. Then you get some results. And these results go into a utility function, an optimizer that is in the upper right corner. And uh, this, this optimizer tweaks the scenarios, creates new scenarios, sweeps through parameters in order to find what it is looking for. Yeah, so this goes in circles until the optimizer is happy and says, oh, I found the perfect um, settings, the set points that you need so that your system is, is performing best. So this is uh, the typical workflow. Inside the co-simulation, of course, is quite complicated. You have different pieces of software, different um, simulation packages and solvers. They need to be initialized and especially synchronized. Yeah? The stepping through the time and synchronizing the variables is sometimes um, pretty tedious. Um, the synchronization of two simulators um, happens at certain points in time. Um, uh, ideally, at the same model time, the two simulators would meet and exchange the variables that they have to exchange. In reality, this exchange happens permanently because the variable is just one of the same physical property. So ideally, these two simulators would permanently exchange these couple of variables, but that is uh, not possible for performance reasons. So you have to make compromises. So at every macro step, these are these fat bars on our timeline, um, the simulators stop all at the same time. So in our case, two simulators stop, maybe all at 10 seconds. They exchange all the variables, and then they step further, they integrate further with their solver in time. And maybe at 15 seconds, they meet again, 20, they meet again, 25, they meet again, and so forth. In between, they have their own time steps might be uh, equidistant, might be dynamic time stepping. Uh, doesn't really matter as long as they meet at predefined macro time steps and exchange the variables. The choice of the macro time step, of course, has an impact on the accuracy. If it's too large, you will get some error that might get bigger over time. Yeah? So you have to carefully choose this macro time step. Uh, in order to balance accuracy and performance. There are different ways of exchanging variables. Um, the most simple one, also that I used in the previous example, is that they just meet at certain time steps and exchange the variables. That has a bit of an error implicitly uh, uh, accepted. Yeah? So if you take the variable from your partner simulator and start integrating, during your integration process, you still have the old value. You always believe your other module, your other simulator, other sub-model uh, uh, is still at the old state, but it's not. It's also proceeding in time. So if that error is small enough and you can live with it, that's fine. This is the most performant, the fastest uh, way of uh, synchronizing. If that is not acceptable, if you need more accuracy, uh, then you have to iterate. So you integrate to your next step, <laughs> then you go back to your partner and say, hey guy, actually I'm already at this value. You didn't know that, but I know now and I'll tell you. And your partner model also says, yeah, same with me. I also proceeded in time. I changed my state from 17 to 17.3. So please uh, reconsider that value. And then you iterate a couple of times until you converge uh, into a, th a certain error threshold. And then you agree both. It's enough now, we are fine. This is reality, let's proceed from here. And the same game starts again with the next step. So these are two um, ways of uh, exchanging variables between such simulators. Here's an example of a 
software setup of different pieces. So we have GridLab D simulating a grid, simulating also uh, the cars that you have seen before, how they are driving and when they are coming back. So this is all done in that simulator. But other parts such as the battery or the distribution grid are simulated in other simulation packages. In this case, in OpenModelica and in Power Factory. Coupling is done in this case, via different interfaces, uh, Power Factory has a certain API for doing that. And yeah, in OpenModelica, we used FMI, functional mockup interface, um, to couple it to GridLabD, which also serves as a master. So here, one of the simulator also assumes the role of a master. This is nothing unusual. You don't have to use a separate uh, master algorithm. Um, with these interfaces, we can even replace simulators. So if, if we're not happy with Power Factory, we could unplug it and plug in a different grid simulator. If we're not happy with the battery simulation with OpenModelica, we can also use Daimler or something else. So that's a modular um, architecture. And the good thing is you can test separately. Right? You can um, um, reduce the complexity of model testing, model checking by um, uh, testing the sub um, models separately. This example led to a couple of um, results that I would like to share with you. The first one, the nice thing is you have so many details that, that you don't have to, to make any compromises anymore. You can use specialized hardcore models for every sub um, uh, model that you, that, you, that you need. You can have unbalanced grids. You can, real ca have, have re can have real chemical models of the batteries, so not first order. Um, uh, um, differential equation. No, no, these are, these are real physical models. Um, you can have the real controls as an emulation uh, in a DLL or as real-time hardware in the loop. So no need to simplify things anymore. Uh, you can use uh, uh, the real validated models. You can invite experts to join in with their models and uh, no need to compromise with the, with the details and all of these details are in focus you're not like lo looking at one thing you know? maybe you're the one that optimizes uh, the market rules in our example you know? but uh, the rest of your simulation setup is is is, uh, is in full detail so while you are optimizing the market rules the battery and the car and the grid are giving you all the details and they will tell you maybe the battery tell you tells you oh I'm, 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 I'm aging too fast if you, if you treat me like this. Your market rules are too nervous for me. Please make something more relaxed. Uh, don't send me a new set point every second. Uh, every hour is also fine. Yeah? So these things uh, that you would never see with the simplified battery model are uh, surfacing in such a co-simulation setup. You see the grid limits. You st see stability problems. All these nitty-gritty details that you would see in the real model or in the real system out there when you implement it, you also see it here. So this is the big, big advantage of uh, co-simulation that you can have any level of detail for your submodels that you want. Another thing that we have observed uh, in this setup was uh, dynamic step size control. Some uh, solvers have that. So they estimate the error of their simulation. And if it's small enough, they, they increase the step size to speed up. And if, it's, if the error starts to get too big, then they reduce the step size again. And here in this um, uh, 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 graph you see on the green uh, line, the smart controls that we have introduced to fix a voltage problem. Yeah? See, the, the red line is a voltage limit that should not be uh, crossed. Yeah? Then the voltage would be too low. Um, and if it happens, the green... In the green case, where we have smart controls, all the cars help. <laughs> they start with smart charging and uh, the, a lot of things happening, and lots of communication and, 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 and um, transients, which is why the step size got really small. Yeah? And the moment we are above the threshold again, uh, when, the, when the problem is fixed, then the step size gets larger again, because all the dynamics are much slower and uh, we can speed up the simulation engines again. Uh, we will not uh, miss anything important. So this dynamic step size control uh, is fully there also in co simulation. Um, another example of uh, this multi-focus 
is uh, um, uh, the impact of uh, telecommunication. In our simulated example, we had the markets, the batteries, the car charging, the car driving, uh, the grid, but also the communication networks. Yeah? So the cars were communicating with the charging station and the charging station were communicating with the markets and these communication networks were not perfect. So we were adding latencies, packet loss, cyber attacks and other funny things to see how robust are our control algorithms against such disturbances, how uh, robust are the market rules and so forth. So um, this is a classical example of discrete and continuous problems that interact. And what you see here is the impact of a growing latency in communications. So we have a problem, but we measure it too late or we react too late because the communication lines are slow or they are overloaded. And then we see how, how big is the impact, how much of uh, a voltage violation do we get because of that uh, communication problem. And you can then make decisions on how good your, your communication network should be. Is power line okay or should we really go for 5G or something more luxurious because the problem is too important? This is the value of co-simulation. Um, you have all the different domains fully covered. You can bring people together. An expert team of diverse backgrounds uh, can work on one of the same simulation. They can keep their tools, their data sets, which are validated and which are uh, um, um, accepted in their, in their uh, domain and you can combine them in a, power, in a, in a co-simulation. So the bottom line is for power systems of the future, for energy systems of the future, you will be faced with multi-multi uh, everything, you know, multi-vector, multi-carrier, and uh, you have to yeah, use different simulators that you couple. This is a, a useful tool, it works. Um, you have seen that uh, in the real-time case, it's much easier because the synchronization worries are gone. On the other side, if you want to simulate uh, 10,000 cases of one year in real time, you will need 10,000 years. Unless you have 10,000 uh, real-time simulators, then it still takes one year. One year takes one year in real time. So you only use that for, for, for fast phenomena, yeah? transients, switching, uh, in the in the in a seconds and milliseconds range, non real time simulators are more complicated. Um, you have to take care for synchronization of different uh, solvers. You have to stop them. You have to uh, step them. This is sometimes quite a software effort, but you get all the flexibility. Important is scenario handling. As I said, with uh, co simulation, you go through scenarios. You search for something, um, and the problem is if you have different simulators, they want to be initialized and configured with different config files and project files and so forth. So this is a bit of a, a software engineering hassle that you have to go through. Um, performance is another issue. Co-simulation is slow, face it. Um, you can help a bit if it's ridiculously parallel, you can maybe run many scenarios in a data center in parallel when you're searching for something, when you're optimizing. But the simulation itself is usually very slow because of the synchronization, uh, because we always have to wait for the slowest member in the team of, 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 of submodels, and that slows down things. And remember, um, it's not an analytical solution. It's an experimental setup. You cannot ask where's my optimum, you have to search for it and you do this with uh, multiple runs. So that you have to embed your, your co-simulation in, in a workflow of optimization. This is it. I hope you enjoyed the lecture today and see you at the next one.